Hello, I'm Monse Alvarado, and this is EWTN News in Depth. Celebrating Christ in the Eucharist, the impact of the International Eucharistic Congress on the Church and the world. One week after the Texas heartbeat law is enacted, a look at how pregnancy centers and pro-life leaders are providing needed care for mothers. What we were able to give each other in, 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 in the ashes and in the wake of 9-11 was that authentic Christian hope. And hope after terror, the steps one priest took in the days following the attacks of September 11th to bring peace to the victims, and how that day continues to inspire him in his mission today. A historic concert, psalms performed in Jewish and Catholic musical interpretations for the first time in Europe's largest synagogue. EWTN News In Depth starts now. A thousand strong choir lifting up their voices at the 52nd International Eucharistic Congress. The packed masses in the center of Budapest are an international witness to the real presence in the Eucharist. The Congress is hosted by Hungary and was originally scheduled for 2020 but postponed due to the pandemic. The event will culminate on September 12th with a closing mass offered by Pope Francis. He will be the first pope to take part in an International Eucharistic Congress in two decades. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth. Tens of thousands of people from around the world are attending the more than week-long event. The mission of the Congress? To make Catholic faithful aware that the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Church's life. Correspondent Colin Flynn is on the ground in Hungary with a look at how that mission is being fulfilled. Hello from Budapest, the capital of Hungary, here in the center of Europe. I'm standing in Kossuth Square in front of the magnificent Parliament building, also known as the House of the Country. It's located on the banks of the Danube River, which flows through the heart of the city, separating Buda and Pest, the two parts that make up Budapest. And this beautiful city is the backdrop for this year's International Eucharistic Congress. The sun was shining down on Hero Square as the Hungarian folk dance group put on a special performance as part of the opening ceremony of the 52nd International Eucharistic Congress. Thousands of Hungarians fill the square as well as line the streets. A choir of over a thousand singers was made up not only of Catholics, but people of other faiths were invited to join as well, many from the Lutheran Church. Also in attendance were 1,300 young people from all over Hungary who were there to make their first Holy Communion. But it was the next day, Monday morning, that the business of the Congress got underway. And this is the very heart of the Congress, the Expo Center, where more than 200,000 people have registered to attend the various talks, programs and workshops across the week. After Mass in the main hall, the keynote speakers took to the stage across the week, one of the first being Cardinal Gerald Lacroix from Quebec in Canada. He spoke to a crowd of mainly young people about striving for peace in the world the joy of knowing that peace is possible. In Christ we find the reconciliation and the peace we long for. It's all in our hearts. We long for peace. We want peace, whoever we are. But in Jesus we can learn. We can, we can encounter the Prince of Peace and he gives us his peace for ourselves and to share with the world. That's enough. Cardinal Louis Raphael Sacco from Iraq spoke about the persecution of Christians in his country. Uh, 48 people killed during the Mass, and among them two young people, two young uh, priests, and I have had them in the seminary. 
when I was rector of the seminary. He also said the Pope's visit to Iraq earlier this year changed the nation. He changed the mentality. You know, he was speaking many times about fraternity and also diversity. We are all brothers and sisters. We don't have to destroy each other. We have to respect each other and to respect the diversity. Behind the scenes at the Congress, there was a huge organizational effort with hundreds of young people volunteering. I think it's great. I think everyone's so like enthusiastic, everyone's so keen and everyone's so faithful. So we're having a, a very good time here. <laughs> EWTN broadcasts live from the Congress across the week and during an interview, Cardinal John Onaeko said that even though he does not understand how the bread turns to the body of Christ, he believes in it. And I must say, even Cardinal Onaeko does not understand mm. how the bread in my hand becomes the blood body of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe it. Yes. That's the point. I believe it. And the belief I have is a gift of God. Laudato si. And earlier today, Friday morning, the president of Hungary, Janos Adder, spoke. He, along with Prime Minister Viktor Orban, are expected to meet with Pope Francis this Sunday morning. On Sunday, Pope Francis will bring to a close the Eucharistic Congress by celebrating Mass here in Freedom Square. And this will be a big moment for Hungary, as the last time they had a papal visit was 25 years ago. That was Pope John Paul II in 1996. In Budapest, Hungary, Colin Flynn for EWTN News In Depth. Religious orders from around the world are attending the Congress, including sisters, priests, cardinals, and bishops. Cardinal Jean-Claude Olerich, the first cardinal to be appointed from Luxembourg, is in Budapest, participating in the Eucharistic celebrations. He is on the record with us. His thoughts on the importance of the Eucharistic Congress. Your Eminence, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. I can hear there's a lot of commotion behind you. It's very exciting. Over the summer, you told Vatican News that Pope Francis is a beacon of hope for the Church in Europe. How is this Congress a reflection of the Holy Father's vision for the future of the Church? No, I think in Europe we have a very weak Church, at least in Western Europe. No? Uh, we live in a very secularized society. Uh, we have very consumeristic attitudes. And for renewal, we need to go back to Christ. We need to make Christ the center of our lives. And this Congress is fantastic uh, because it's just that, centered on Jesus Christ, dead on the cross for us, risen from the dead, present in the Eucharist. There's just one regret I have because of pandemia uh, there are many, many Hungarians here. Of course, that's very positive that they are here. But I regret that there are not more people from the rest of Europe and from the world who could come to join this fantastic Congress. Yes, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a, a heartbreaking reality for many people around the globe, but thankfully, through EWTN's coverage, they can all watch online. Um, in today's homily, you mentioned that the flame of faith in Europe is becoming very small, just like you talked about now, um, and that its cultural structures at what, are what will help to fan those flames of faith. How might Catholics around the world apply these important words from your homily? So, uh, I see in my own home country, in Luxembourg, uh, many people have stopped coming to church during pandemia. And they will not come back because they were cultural Christians. So, they were used to come to Mass as I have a certain ritual for taking my coffee in the morning. Mm. And now, they have noticed that they do not need, in fact, this ritual, they can live without it. So they will not come back. But I think that's, of course, every person who doesn't come back, it's a pity. 
but at the same time it's also a chance for the church because we can gather really the strength of the people who have believed and make a new start. I think it's time to make a new start for evangelization in Europe. That's very exciting. You also stress the importance of love, love as the fuel that brings our faith to life in our actions, nourished by the Eucharist. Why did you focus on this aspect of our faith? If we always have to make sure that everything we do is God's will, and sometimes we have our own ideas, our own plans, and they might sound intelligent. They might sound very good. But God might have other plans. And I'm sure you believe me that God's plans are always better than our plans. Oh, yes. I want to give you one example from uh, a Jesuit, Father Arupe. He had asked to go to Japan, but he was told to study medicine instead. So he studied medicine. And uh, before he got his doctor title, he was told, go to Japan. And he did it. So you could say, but that's nonsense. That's not logical. Uh, but he was in Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. Wow. And he could take care. He could hospitalize people at the Jesuit novice in Nagatsuka in Hiroshima. That is how divine providence works. That is how God's plans work. So we must always make sure that we are in God's plans. And I think the Eucharist uh, is a help for us. It helps us to find our way in this world. If we participate in the Eucharist, if we take communion, uh, we are on God's side and we will be guided by the Holy Spirit in our normal lives. It's that great act of humility and love in submitting ourselves to the will of God. What can we expect then from our church leaders like yourself after this great celebration in our belief in the real presence of Jesus Christ? Once it concludes, what can we expect? So first of all, uh, you know that I love young people because I have worked at university for so long. And so I want to tell young people in my country about this Congress. I have started a youth council in our diocese, so I will tell them about this Congress. And I will seek their advice because they are baptized, they have received confirmation, they go to mass, so God is also speaking to the church and to the bishop through them. And together with them, I want to look how we can evangelize uh, our country, our diocese again. And I am sure that many bishops have similar plans. Not the same because experiences are different, but uh, the bishops are also touched by the grace of God during this Congress and I think we all know that in Europe, we have to become a missionary church again. Do you have any preview for us of what Pope Francis hopes to say when he closes the Congress? Ah, no. <laughs> I'm no prophet. <laughs> well, we were but, looking for uh, a little soundbite, yeah. The Pope will always have words uh, very simple words with a great depth to lead us to Christ, to be witnesses of Christ. I'm sure of that. I mean, he, I'm not a prophet, but he is a prophet. You know? He is a prophet in our world, in our times, a prophet who came from afar, as he said himself, when he came to Europe and had to stay here. So I am looking forward to what he will tell us, because what the Pope tells us, we have to listen to it in order to discover the will of God. I know our viewers are looking forward to that as well. And as you implored the church today, we will be praying for an increase in faith. Thank you so much for joining us, Cardinal.
Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be with you. God bless you. EWTN is providing full coverage of the 52nd International Eucharistic Congress. Check out EWTN.com and click on Schedule to see a complete listing of our coverage. Still to come, a panel discussion on the impact of the Texas abortion law, how pro-life pregnancy centers are stepping up to help mothers in need. Mass in the language of a culture rarely recognized. Plus, Hungary's Minister of Families shares her thoughts on the impacts the Eucharistic Congress has had on her country. A festive start to the International Eucharistic Congress in Budapest, a reflection of the Universal Church in a cultural celebration of our Catholic faith. Welcome back to EWTN News in Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. Hungary is hosting tens of thousands of faithful from around the world for this historic Congress. An event like this leaves a profound mark on the host country and its people. Katarina Novak, Hungary's Minister of Families, shares her insight on the 52nd International Eucharistic Congress. Thank you, Minister Novak, for taking the time to speak with us today. This is an exciting moment for Budapest, hosting such an important global event. And although you're not Catholic, why is this Congress so exciting to you? Well, it is a really inspiring time for Hungary because of the International Eucharistic Congress that is taking place in Budapest. Uh, it is a, a worldwide event that draws the attention to the strength uh, of Christianity and the strength of uh, our be belief. Uh, and uh, uh, that is why I think uh, that for us, it is a moment uh, of, uh, of, of international interest, uh, a moment where the international attention is focused uh, on our capital and our country, but it is not our capital, not our country, which is in the focus, but it's Jesus Christ who is in the focus, who is in the focus of all of us uh, Christian people. Uh, and uh, no matter that I am myself a Reformed Calvinist, uh, for me it is also a privileged uh, week that uh, we can share this with uh, each other, uh, with our brothers and sisters from all around the world. That's beautiful. You've mentioned this importance of Christian culture before. Can you tell us a little more about that for Hungary? Um, my firm belief is uh, that for us uh, Europeans, for us Hungarians, uh, Christianity is not a matter of choice, it is a predestination. Uh, so we have uh, Hungarians, a thousand-year-old Christian history. That means that our first king who founded our country chose Christianity. So that is our faith, that is uh, our uh, predestination. It is not a choice of, an, of our everyday life. But uh, we tend to forget this. And uh, us, I mean, we uh, Europeans, uh, not so much Hungarians, but Europeans in general, our Christian traditions, our Christian culture, that we have our Judeo-Christian roots and our Christian culture that determines our everyday lives. I mean, just think about uh, our holidays, for example. Uh, for us, the, the most important uh, family holidays are the Christian holidays. Uh, this is uh, Christmas uh, and this is Easter. So we, we, are, we live our lives uh, in a Christian way. Uh, our culture is Christian by, by, by itself, uh, by definition. Uh, so we shouldn't give this up. We, we won't be any more tolerant if uh, we give up on our Christianity and we tend to forget uh, our roots. You've mentioned that importance of the Christian reality and Christian heritage of Europe in a lot of your interviews and discussions. Part of your focus on faith includes investing in the family. And Hungary is really leading the global discussion in the role of government in supporting families and married couples. How are the programs that you proposed in 2019 faring for your country? 2019 was a major step, but we started already in 2010. That was the time when our political family uh, got a governmental position uh, from by the by the decision of the Hungarian people, and ever ever since uh, 
uh, we won all the elections by two third majority. So that means that uh, we are in a position to really change things and to 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 drive a family oriented, a pro family policy here in Hungary. That means that we focus on the traditional families, that we support married couples, that we support uh, young uh, married couples who are about to have children in the future, and also those who already raise children, no matter if they are married or not. But once the child is there, this child is protected. That means the child is protected from the moment of conception and uh, is uh, the, the target, let's say, of all our uh, uh, benefits, of all our supports, not only financial ones, but it means also that we try to implement a family-friendly mentality. And uh, just one, some elements of our family policies are our family-oriented tax system, which means that the more uh, children you have, the less personal income tax you pay in Hungary. Uh, women or mothers with at least four children have a lifelong exemption from personal income tax paying. So they don't pay, pay any personal income tax ever in their lives. Now we introduce it also for uh, the young people below 25 from the 1st of January next year. So we try to support through our tax system childbearing and, uh, and, and families. And also we support uh, housing. We have housing subsidies. Or for example, when you have a student loan and then later on you're going to have children, we decrease your student loan or totally write off your student loan if you are going, when you are going to have uh, children in the future. We also support uh, daycare services or, or child catering or summer camps of the children. The, or textbooks we provide uh, free of charge for the families to and support also their educational large, endeavors. Exactly. And large families or single parent families we also support. So we are trying to do our utmost in order to 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 make it uh, easier to to raise uh, children in a responsible manner here in Hungary. One last question just about the importance of Hungarian culture. How has this congress helped to feature your beautiful cultural traditions? Well, when I uh, had the privilege to participate already at different events of this Europe Eucharistic Congress, and I will still have some uh, other uh, uh, events uh, to, to participate to, uh, I, I just felt the, the strength uh, of uh, the presence of Jesus Christ. And uh, that uh, also draws the attention of the ones who are still not in the a firm uh, commitment of uh, being uh, a Christian themselves. Uh, so I think that for them, uh, also who declare themselves uh, non-believers, let's say, it, 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 it also raises a, an issue, a question that uh, where does this strength come from? And uh, how come that these uh, people are are so um, so committed? Uh, and, and, and so I joyful. Think that, uh, yes, and so joyful, exactly. And, and where do this this love uh, come from? So different people. We had, for example, events for for Roma people here in Hungary. We, do, we, have, we have a large Roma community living in Hungary, and also uh, for Greek Catholics and so on and so on. So it's uh, it just it just shows us all that uh, that uh, there is a. Uh, there is this attraction uh, of uh, of Jesus Christ that you either have already experienced in your life or maybe not, but uh, but at least uh, it it raises your attention uh, to 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 some to to the missing of this. To if something you don't have higher, it. absolutely. This beautiful exactly. strength and diversity and what draws us to the real presence of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Minister Novak, for this, and we'll be watching closely how everything will conclude with the the Holy Father's Mass. Thank you so much. The International Eucharistic Congress is part of a 140-year-old Catholic tradition, urging Catholics to dig deeper into their faith. Dr. Matthew Bunsen, executive editor of EWTN News and Washington, D.C. bureau chief, has been hosting EWTN's week-long coverage of the Congress from Budapest. He joins us now to provide insight on the programs that are inspiring the faithful. Matthew, you've been covering the week-long Congress. We can see the breakdown of everything behind you. What have been the major moments of the Congress so far? 
Well, I have to say that uh, we've had several remarkable catecheses uh, performed here, delivered here by the likes of Hilarion Alfeyev, representative and metropolitan of the Russian Orthodox Church. We had uh, remarkable catecheses from Cardinal Dominic Duca, the Archbishop of Prague, and Cardinal Oneyakon of Nigeria. But I think the most extraordinary moments have been those that have occurred outside of the Expo Hall. The, the one was a divine liturgy of the Byzantine Rite uh, the other night at St. Stephen's Basilica, and another was uh, uh, the the magnificent Eucharistic adoration that took place here, which really helps to focus us once again on the centrality of the Eucharist here at an International Eucharistic Congress, to state the obvious. And then I think we'll have uh, the procession tomorrow night that's also going to be very striking. I know. We can't wait to see that. You mentioned the Russian Orthodox leader, Metropolitan Hilleron, and how he gave a catechesis. He outlined this Eastern Orthodox understanding of the Eucharist. What is the significance of his reflections and the relationship to the Catholic Church? Well, his presence here uh, had a, several significant uh, aspects to it. The first is the simple fact that he was here as a representative of the Russian Orthodox Church, the, the largest patriarchate of the Orthodox world. Uh, he is its foreign minister, so he would be here with essentially the blessing of Patriarch Kirill of Moscow. That's important. But the other aspect was the participation of the Orthodox in reaffirming the centrality of the Eucharist for all believers at a time, as he stressed uh, several times, uh, that the belief in the real presence uh, is waning, that belief in faith is waning. And so this is a statement of support for the Catholic Church and for the Christian faith overall. Yes, I found that remarkable. Um, but also your interview with Cardinal Charles Mangbo, the first cardinal of Myanmar appointed in 2015. You sat down with him for an interview at the Congress. What kind of pressure did he say the church is facing there? Well, he is a representative of the church persecuted. Uh, he comes from a place where, as you note, the, the church is severely persecuted in a part of the world where the church is persecuted. So he came to deliver that message of uh, helping us, all of us to understand just how suffering church people are around the world, but also to stress the centrality again of the Eucharist and the fact that we are a people of hope. I was struck by him. I was struck by Cardinal Duca and by Cardinal Oneyakon, three prelates from three different parts of the world that have endured faith or uh, uh, martyrdom or are currently enduring martyrdom, uh, and all three were filled with joy, hope, and faith. That's good to hear. The global nature of the church is really on display in this important moment. You talked about that in the beginning of your comments. How do you think this Congress is unique? What is it going to be remembered for? I think it will be remembered first and foremost uh, for the presence of Pope Francis. Any papal visit to a Eucharistic Congress historically has been uh, an important moment. But I think also for Central Europe, this is uh, an indicator, as uh, was made clear with uh, Minister Novak, uh, that there is much to be said from a Eucharistic Congress for the, the faith of individual Catholics, for helping them to live the faith and to love the faith, uh, and then to take that into culture. We keep hearing here the, the importance of the kerygma, of the proclamation of the gospel. And as uh, people leave here uh, filled with the spirit, and but also filled with this catechesis and this testimony, uh, they're expected to take this home with them and then to proclaim it wherever they live. And that's really been the great goal of Eucharistic Congresses from the very beginning in 1881. Well, we'll be watching for that. We make sure that we'll be carrying that with us, too, throughout the great coverage that you and the team on the ground have been doing. We really appreciate it, Matthew. Great to be with you, and sorry for the noise. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> the Eucharistic Congress also featured a mass setting in Lavari, the language spoken by the Romani people of Hungary, who are more commonly known as gypsies. <laughs> The mass setting marks a significant moment for the traditionally nomadic Romani people who are Hungary's largest minority group. The authentic musical composition was written just for this occasion. I also hope that we can uh, perform this mass uh, in, in many countries and many cities. I think uh, this cultural uh, event also helps the people to uh, accept each other. So this is what music is about, to accept each other. Music bringing Catholics together. The full text of the Bible was translated and published in the Gypsy or Lavari language only a few years ago. 
We brought you a story of the Romani people two months ago here on EWTN News In Depth. You can check it out again on the EWTN YouTube page and get access to more when you hit the subscribe button. We invite you to also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to check out pictures and videos of the Eucharistic Congress that's exclusive to our social media channels. Our team in Hungary is providing unique on-the-ground coverage of the Congress, highlight reels, and much more. President Biden announces a vaccine mandate for federal workers and employers. That story is still to come. A lot of people needed to talk. They needed a, a hug. And what was beautiful was that faith was grounding people in a type of time of crisis. Ministering in the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. As feelings of fear, sorrow, and anger swept across the nation, a Catholic priest was helping people find peace and calm in their faith. A landmark abortion ruling in Mexico this week. The Supreme Court there voted to decriminalize abortion, making it unconstitutional to penalize a woman who gets an abortion. Currently, abortion is only legal in four states under most circumstances. The other 28 states penalize abortion with some exceptions. The decision took effect immediately for the state of Coahuila, which sits on the border of Texas. But the decision could pave the way for decriminalization of abortions across all of Mexico. We'll bring you more on this in the coming weeks. The decision in Mexico comes a week after a law banning most abortions in Texas took effect. The Department of Justice filed a federal lawsuit against the state of Texas on Thursday, claiming that the law is unconstitutional. Attorney General Merrick Garland is asking a federal judge to declare the law invalid. The law signed by Governor Greg Abbott prohibits abortions once medical professionals can detect a heartbeat, usually around six weeks. The law also allows private citizens to bring lawsuits against abortion providers or anyone who helps a woman procure an abortion. Abortion patients themselves, however, cannot be sued. The person bringing the lawsuit is entitled to at least $10,000 in damages if they prevail in court. While the Texas law has sparked controversy on several fronts, we at EWTN News In Depth want to discuss the Catholic narrative and our call to action. The CARE pro-life organizations are and should be providing for these mothers. To provide context to this discussion, we're joined now by Jeannie Mancini, president of the March for Life, and Carrie Severino, president of the Judicial Crisis Network. Thank you both for joining me. Jeannie, you've been at the forefront of the pro-life movement for many years. How should Catholics be thinking about this law? Well, first of all, it's an incredible moment to learn about childhood development, right? I mean, have we ever had so many Americans talking about a heart beating at six weeks of development of the unborn? It's just beautiful to consider that. Uh, and it's also just amazing to see all that's happening at the level of the state. So just to reflect upon that for a minute and to know how powerful the pro-life grassroots at the level of the states is and should be. Uh, it's it's just a moment to celebrate, but but also to pray, I think, and to fast as we're all trying to build a culture of life in our own ways. And Carrie, how does this law actually work? What are the specifics of enforcement? I know there's been a lot of outrage over the $10,000, what some people are calling bounty, that comes with suing someone over an abortion procedure. Oh, right. So uh, the, the meat of the law is that it does prohibit abortions after a fetal heartbeat can be detected, which, of course, is typically about six weeks. But it does so in an unusual way, particularly because other laws regulating abortion tended to get struck down before they were even enacted. So this law, instead of having the state enforce that against abortionists, it has it where an individual could enforce it through a lawsuit. It's not the only kind of law that works that way. Uh, there, are other, there are other federal laws that allow individuals to say, if you, if you identify a case of fraud, for example, that you can bring a lawsuit and then uh, get what, in, in that case, maybe you could also term was a bounty for having identified that. But, um, but really, it's an unusual uh, structure that was designed to help it go into effect before um, the courts were able to block it. Now, in order to actually come to a, a, a conclusion as to whether it's constitutional or not, which would be farther down the road, they would actually have to perform an abortion and have someone then sue either the abortionist or someone else who's contributing to helping uh, procure that abortion. And the rumor on most major networks is that the Supreme Court's refusal to block the Texas law undermines Roe v. Wade and Casey and effectively overturns them. Can you clear that up for us, Carrie? 
Uh, yeah, it, it actually doesn't do that. Really, the ruling had to do with who can be sued in this case. And as I said, since the state isn't actually enforcing this law, when the pregnancy set, uh, when the uh, abortion uh, groups were suing the state, uh, they were suing the wrong people because they aren't the ones tasked with enforcing the law. So that was the real reason the Supreme Court didn't take up the case at this point, allowing then the law to go into effect. If there were a real situation where someone sued someone for procuring an abortion under this law, then there there would be proper defendants. And then you'd have a chance where the Supreme Court could get down to the real question of, is it constitutional? Which, of course, implicates Roe versus Wade. But that's several steps down the line. Chances are uh, that wouldn't happen certainly anytime sooner than the case they already have teed up, which I know we can talk about later, that, that is going to address the core question of whether Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey are good constitutional law. That's exactly right. Jeannie, knowing the issue of abortion restrictions will be discussed at the court, many people are pointing to the consequences of abortion restrictions, citing that we'll see back alley abortions and women crossing state lines. How are pro-life groups in Texas responding to this and caring for women? Uh, well, really courageously. And of course, they've had su such an infrastructure already set up in Texas. When you compare the number of pregnancy care centers to abortion clinics in Texas, there are 10 PRCs to every one abortion clinic in Texas. Um, what we saw is that the same day that uh, September 1st, that this was uh, enacted, that it began, the state also passed a hundred million dollars piece of legislation that would help support women with alternatives to abortion. So um, the pregnancy care center, in addition to that funding stream, is such a wonderful support. Uh, collectively around the country every year, they also provide over a hundred million dollars in free resources. So this can be diapers, formula, child care, housing, ultrasounds, et cetera. So uh, we're seeing, you know, sort of this untold story of the Pregnancy Care Center really come to the fore in terms of the lives that are being saved every day in Texas right now, which, Monse, by the way, is about 130 lives. And what we're hearing from the Pregnancy Care Centers is that they're maybe, you know, doing as many ultrasounds as they typically do in two weeks in the time period of one week over the course of this uh, last week. Wow, over 100 lives per day that are being saved. And there is, can you explain a little bit more about this flow of money coming out from the state of Texas? What is it specifically supposed to do? So this supports alternatives to abortion. So things like uh, basically people who are considering adoption, um, again, giving some resources to women. So the anything from material resources to housing, et cetera. So $100 million that was simultaneously funded uh, for this very purpose. Carrie, President Biden's Justice Department moved quickly to file a lawsuit claiming that the law in Texas is unconstitutional. What were the grounds for that lawsuit? Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're it's pretty much of a legal stretch in that case, Monsi. It was a, they basically said, you know, the Constitution prohibits it, which under current constitutional law with Rowan Casey, it does. And they say, well, we basically have a freestanding right to sue over that. And they say they can sue not just the state of Texas, which, as we discussed, isn't actually the one enforcing the law, but all citizens of Texas or anyone who might sue in Texas. That's just not how uh, lawsuits normally work. It's, it's a real bank shot. And I think it's more of a publicity stunt than anything, because they're just trying to do something to show uh, the, you know, the, really the deep pockets in the abortion industry and other dark money groups who are supporting uh, this administration, got them into office, who uh, want them to be as radical as possible on this issue. It's sad that a, a president who once uh, was touting himself as a pro-life politician now is taking not even just a neutral stance to this, but really an aggressive and uh, very extreme uh, stance on this issue. And really quickly, when it comes to issues of federal federal versus states' rights, is there anything that uh, was, was pulled out on in this lawsuit that could potentially be concerning for the people of Texas? Uh, you know, I, I, the biggest problem here is that the, the Department of Justice under Merrick Garland is trying to uh, invent a freestanding right to just sue any state that they think they, the law doesn't comport with the Constitution. That's never how it's worked. You need to have an actual issue and a case before the court where there's a there's a, a, a facts on the ground. So if there were facts on the ground that they're saying there's an abortion here that is protected by the Constitution and Texas is prohibiting it, they then they could maybe bring the lawsuit. You can't just go in and say, hey, we don't like 
like Texas's law. That is a real overreach of the federal power. States, as we know, particularly because the Constitution doesn't actually speak to this issue, it's an issue that really the states have the right to determine how they're going to uh, protect their citizens, including uh, both the women who are pregnant and their unborn children. Jeannie, there was one thing that was extreme and concerning for us is the Justice Department's claim in their case that unaccompanied children receiving federal refugee services need access to abortions. Is this something that's been a priority for the administration before? It, it has, but I don't think they've ever pushed it this far. So we can think back five or six years when different pro-life uh, grantees were denied funding for this very office, and that was sort of peripheral um, to this issue. And then more recently, under the Trump administration, there was an issue with transport of minors to potentially receive an abortion. Um, so now to push this as far, even in the language, to, to talk about a so-called right for these young people who've been traumatized, I mean, already coming into our country and really are being used as a pawn, in my humble opinion, um, in, in this situation is, is just really heinous. Carrie, last question for you. How does this case, the Texas case and the lawsuit from the federal government, how does it affect the future of the Dobbs case out of Mississippi that will be heard in November by the Supreme Court? Well, you know, I think the ruling we've already had in this case gives me hope in that case because we saw when the the emergency stay application was made people trying to block this law before it even went into effect that we had five justices who stood firm against a lot of political pressure a lot of pressure in the media saying oh my gosh the sky is falling you have to block this bill and we're still hearing uh, their hyperbolic rhetoric that really is distorting what the bill is even actually about um and, and the, the fact that we have five Supreme Court justices who are willing to say, you know what, even in the abortion area, the standards of law, the rule of law stands firm. That's very good news. It should, you should be nine justices, right? But unfortunately, we've seen in many cases that justices kind of suspend the rules when it comes to abortion. We, we now have a court that, that doesn't seem to be doing this. That's right. We're not sure what that will be, and we're very much looking out for that. Thank you so much, Jeannie and Carrie, for your analysis on this important situation. Thanks. Thanks for having us. If you're pregnant and need support, there are many organizations that can help you, including the Gabriel Project, which is a parish-based ministry to support pregnant mothers and their unborn children. You can find out more at gabrielproject.org. There's a directory of cities they provide assistance in at the bottom of their page. You can also visit the sistersoflife.org, who operate in several U.S. cities and in Canada. A vaccine mandate to affect more than 100 million Americans. That news after the break. The international community has made clear its expectation that the Afghan people deserve an inclusive government. As the Taliban names a new interim government, how the Biden administration is responding up next. President Biden announced sweeping new federal COVID-19 vaccine mandates on Thursday. That tops our week in review. The president says the requirements are part of a new action plan to address a rise in COVID cases. The mandate will affect as many as 100 million Americans. The expansive rules to come from the Department of Labor mandate that all employers with more than 100 workers require them to be vaccinated or tested weekly for the virus. It requires all federal workers and contractors to get vaccinated as well as healthcare workers and calls for entertainment venues to require proof of vaccination or testing to enter and requires employers to provide pay time off for workers to get vaccinated. This is not about freedom or personal choice. It's about protecting yourself and those around you. While the vaccines provide strong protection for the vaccinated, we read about and hear about and we see the stories of hospitalized people, people on their deathbeds, among the unvaccinated over the past few weeks. This is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. A Centers for Disease Control study shows that unvaccinated people are five times more likely to be infected with COVID and 20 times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID than those who are fully vaccinated. The first large-scale international passenger flight to depart Kabul since U.S. military withdrawal of Afghanistan took off on Thursday. Some 200 U.S. and other foreign citizens were on the flight to Qatar, making a significant breakthrough after the Taliban blocked charter flights from departing. It remains uncertain what the resumption of international flights will mean for Afghans who are still desperate to flee Afghanistan. The flight comes after a Taliban spokesman announced a new interim government. The cabinet is stacked with veterans of the regime 
regime and includes a man on the FBI's most wanted list, Sirajuddin Haqqani, who is blamed for many deadly attacks and kidnappings in Afghanistan. The Taliban says it wants international recognition of their new government, but world leaders who have already criticized the lack of diversity of the government are cautious in their response. We understand the Taliban has presented this as a caretaker cabinet. We will judge it and them by its actions. The Taliban seek international legitimacy and support. Any legitimacy, any support will have to be earned. The humanitarian crisis that threatens millions of Afghans has countries sending much-needed food and medical supplies to help. Afghanistan is facing economic collapse as nearly as 80 percent of the country's budget came from international funds. The impact of Hurricane Ida is still taking a heavy toll on Americans. Eleven additional deaths are being linked to the storm. A total of 82 people from Louisiana to New York have now officially died from the storm. This week, the Louisiana Department of Health said two people died of carbon monoxide poisoning and the others from excessive heat during a power outage. Hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses remain without power. Tens of thousands are still without running water, and access to fuel remains difficult. Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed a voting law earlier this week that he says protects election integrity, but opponents say restricts voting access. The bill expands access to early voting, but puts new restrictions on late-night voting. It bans drive through voting, requires ID information for vote by mail, and monthly voter roll checks. The law is already the target of three federal lawsuits. A new bishop has been ordained in China for the city of Wuhan. Father Francis Kui King Ki is the sixth bishop consecrated under the 2018 Vatican-China deal. The 57-year-old Franciscan is said to be close to the Chinese government. The Wuhan diocese has been without a bishop for the past 14 years, with Father Kui filling the role since 2012. The Chinese communist regime has been accused of severe religious persecution of Catholics and people of all faiths. When we return, finding faith amid the ashes of 9-11 as we remember the deadliest attack on our nation. We learn about the spiritual aid one priest was able to share for both the victims and the survivors. This is the house of, of prayer. A Jewish house of prayer open to Catholic religious. How this musical event is answering a call from Pope Francis. That's next. This weekend, our nation remembers a somber anniversary. 20 years ago, the United States suffered the deadliest foreign assault on U.S. soil, the attacks of September 11th. We watched in horror at the coordinated terror unfolding in New York City, the Pentagon, and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It was a day that changed the nation forever a day we will never forget. The memory of the attacks are etched in millions of Americans' memories as reports came in of a plane hitting the North Tower of the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan. And then, minutes later, a second plane hit the South Tower. Smoke rising from the iconic 110-story towers was broadcast on every news station around the world. As thousands of civilians in the towers tried to escape the flames, first responders ran toward the danger. More than 2,700 people were killed in New York. As millions watched what was happening in New York, a third hijacked plane circled over Washington, D.C. before crashing into the west side of the Pentagon at 9.45 a.m. in the morning. A massive inferno caused a giant portion of the concrete building to collapse. 184 people on board and employees inside the U.S. military headquarters were killed. And in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, a fourth hijacked plane crashed in a field. The terrorists' plan to hit the U.S. Capitol was thwarted because of the selfless and courageous actions of the 40 passengers and crew on board. They took control of the plane, saving an untold number of lives in our nation's capital. While the nation and the world came to grips with the horror of that day, and first responders searched tirelessly amid the rubble for any possible survivors at Ground Zero, one priest made it his mission to carve a path of peace for those who had survived and those who had perished. Reporter Mark Irons has the story. We have to be people of peace. We have to be people who crave peace. Drop what you're doing, report to your company. A major disaster is occurring. Two decades since the deadliest terrorist attack in U.S. history, Monsignor Eugene Silva is committed to bringing peace to one small corner of the world in Patterson, New Jersey, about 20 miles outside New York City. 
We are so blessed here. He's the rector of St. John the Baptist Cathedral. The surrounding community has its struggles with crime, drug abuse, and poverty, but his deep desire is to give people hope. I'm so passionate about what we're doing here, and I think a lot of it can go back to what I experienced 20 years ago. Father Silva, then president of a Catholic high school in Patterson, led the students in prayer. Later that day, he received a phone message. Saying they needed a priest at Ground Zero at the morgue. Uh, would I be willing to go? The next morning, he arrived at Ground Zero. Literally, the dust hadn't settled. It was, it was hours after. Providing spiritual care. It's a lot of people needed to talk. They needed a, a hug. Silva was joined by a Jewish rabbi, and the two would pray over and bless lives lost the remains of victims discovered by first responders. And the first responders would come in and they'd have bags or they'd have people. Um, together we would pray. Moved by the reverence of workers searching through the rubble, the priest added prayers for them as well. Calling down the Holy Spirit and, and for eternal rest, but for eternal hope also on those who were the first responders. What was beautiful was that faith was grounding people in a time of crisis. 20 years later, Monsignor Silva says he can still smell smoldering ground zero, and he'll never forget one question he got from a young firefighter covered in dust and ashes. We were talking and said, could the, these be the ashes of people who died? Silva thought about that, Covered in dust himself that day, he wanted to be respectful when he returned back to the rectory late that night in Patterson. I decided to put the clothes in a bag and to bury them. The hours after 9-11 are still vivid for him and hard to talk about. In the years following the attack, Monsignor Silva would study in Rome and take on a position at the Vatican. But he always knew he'd like to be back here outside New York City, helping meet the needs of the poor, hungry, and outcast. When people know that the Catholic Church cares about their human needs, I think it opens them up to faith. He also serves as chaplain for the Patterson Police and Fire Departments. And he isn't forgetting those first responders still living who spent months in the recovery effort at Ground Zero. Many are suffering the consequences now to their physical and mental health. As a country, we have to be attentive to what they need 20 years later. And the work for peace must continue. Monsignor Silva says blessings come out of suffering, calling it the way of the cross. How is it that we can transform suffering and tragedy by loving? Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. EWTN will be holding a special mass in commemoration of those who lost their lives in the 9-11 attacks. From Our Lady of Angels Chapel in Irondale, Alabama, it will be broadcast live on Saturday morning at 8 a.m. with an encore airing at 7 p.m. We usually end our broadcast with stories from around the world that reflect our Catholic faith and its impact. Today, we share a historic verse for Europe's largest synagogue, how a special concert is building unity between Christianity and Judaism on the eve of one of Judaism's greatest holy days, the Jewish New Year. Colin Flynn joins us again with our Images of the Week. I'm standing in an area called District 7, right in the heart of Budapest, otherwise known as the Jewish Quarter. Now today, it's filled with trendy bars and fancy art galleries, but traditionally, this is where the Jewish community called home. And right over here, their pride and joy, because this is the Dohan Street Synagogue, also known as the Great Synagogue, because it is the largest synagogue in all of Europe. And tonight, people are gathering here of all faith backgrounds for a very special concert. Built in 1859, this synagogue stands as a proud symbol of the Jewish people and their faith, who for years here in Hungary were not even permitted to build such a structure. And 
tonight's performance is highly symbolic as both religions, Christianity and Judaism, are coming together to be unified by music. Hungarian Cardinal Peter Erdo, as well as other officials from the Catholic Church, are in attendance. Robert Froelich is the chief rabbi of this synagogue. The speciality of this night was the audience because there was never such an evening in the history of the synagogue that about uh, 50 clergymen, high-ranked clergymen, arrived to the synagogue for a concert. As Hungary is playing host to the Eucharistic Congress and Pope Francis will be visiting the country, Rabbi Froelich wanted to answer the Pope's call for interreligious dialogue. As a, a prelude to his visit, we made here a concert to show the common ground of the two great monotheistic religions, the uh, Christianity and the Judaism. The Sultai Chamber Orchestra performs pieces from both Jewish and Christian composers, intertwined in harmony. Sister Angelica Snyder is a Dominican sister based in Hungary and was in the audience. This uh, performance was a real uh, moment of dialogue between the two faiths or the two religions. There are also choral and solo performances, their haunting voices echoing through the magnificent synagogue. We showed that if we can sing together, we have the common ground, maybe we can live together in peace. We try to reflect on, on our uh, common uh, grounds and our common uh, funda foundations of our faith. I feel that uh, God is really uh, present here. So this is the house of, of prayer uh, for everybody. <laughs> When they built this synagogue, they said that it would symbolize integration, remembrance, and an openness to all. And tonight's concert is a perfect example of that, bringing people together, united by music, and focusing on the things we have in common, rather than the differences between us. In Budapest, Hungary, Colm Flynn for EWTN News In Depth. A beautiful communion of music and faiths. That does it for us here at EWTN News In Depth. We hope you enjoyed our program. I'm Monse Alvarado. Tune in next week for more in-depth Catholic conversations.